Um, I also like to thank Kathy and Elise, um, who is the Assistant Director of Library Services, to the Library Board and Friends. I also like to give a big thank you to Ashley, who does the programming. Oh, could you stand up, Ashley? Just in case anybody doesn't know her, you should. She's amazing. Um, truly, like, what the COA is about. Okay, so now for our program. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Bill Elliott. Um, and he's going to tell you more of what he does because I could go on for a while. He's an arranger, orchestrator, composer, conductor, band leader, and he's made a specialty of composing, arranging, and producing vintage style of music. His recent work on Broadway has earned him three Tony nominations, including a win for An American in Paris in 2015 and two Drama Desk nominations, including a win for Bandstand in 2017. Um, some of my favorites of what he's done, he's standing over there, which is why I'm looking over there. Um, he got an Emmy nomination as music director for Michael Feinstein's PBS special, The Sinatra Legacy. If you haven't seen it, it's really amazing. Um, see, I didn't even know that this was you when I was watching all this. Yeah, he is a prolific arranger for Boston Pops, New York Pops, Hollywood Bowl Orchestra. He's done orchestra arrangements for Barbara Hannigan, Kelly O'Hare, Sutton Foster, another Tony winner, and Josh Brogan's Stages album. He's also done television work for Northern Exposure, Independence Day, Gilmore Girls, Cinderella Man, and Wedding Crashers, one of my favorite weird movies. Um, so he, sorry, wait, I'm skipping around a little bit. In 2004, he came back here to the Boston area, and he teaches at Berkeley, arranging orchestration and arranging. Um, he's really gotten, enjoyed getting to know his students from around the world and former students as they become successful colleagues in their professional work. His new work, return, his return to the East Coast also led to new directions in his own career, working with the Boston Pops under Keith Lockhart, working on Broadway, and elsewhere as an orchestrator. He will tell you more, but let's welcome him. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, and hello everyone. Thank you for turning out on this uh, uh, rainy night. So I'm very happy to be here with you. Um, I'm a local boy. I was born in Cambridge, lived in Wayland, for, uh, went, went to Wayland High School. Um, when I first moved back here, after being in Los Angeles for many years, lived in Wellesley for three years, now live in Holliston. So I spent a lot of time around here. And um, uh, I'm going to be telling you about my lifelong fascination with the music of George Gershwin. Um, I'll, I'll be focusing on that and mentioning some of the other things that I do. Uh, but ma mainly focusing on my uh, passion for Gershwin's music and the good fortune I've had in recent years being able to work on several uh, Gershwin musicals on Broadway and elsewhere. So that's, that'll be my focus. Um, so I want to start, I have a couple of props here. Um, I'll, here's my first prop. This is a record of the Boston Pops playing Rhapsody in Blue and American in Paris. The record was made in 1960. My father gave it to me for a birthday when I was about 12 years old. And at the time I was playing clarinet and he thought I'd be fascinated by the beginning of Rhapsody in Blue with the famous clarinet opening, and I was. I tried to do it, I could never do it very well. Um, but this record started my, my passion for Gershwin music. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that I still have it. I also still have a record player to play it on. <laughs> so, so that's that was the that was the start for me. And another prop that I have. <clears throat> this is a Gershwin songbook, um, and this is my own copy. But before I had my own copy, I took out the copy that was here at the previous Wellesley Library, which I remember very well. The sort of 1960 modern building with the colored panels, right? It was right here, and uh, the, the music shelf of the Wellesley Library, um, as well as the Wayland Library, uh, were big parts of my life as a teenager. And this is a Gershwin songbook, and I was fascinated with this music. So just briefly, as, when I was a teenager, I was involved in the music of my time, which was the Beatles and the Doors and the Jefferson Airplane and so on. And I first had a career in the pop music of the day, and was working in playing with bands and, and doing a lot of work. Um, but I also had an interest 
with music from before I was born. Oh, and I, I forgot I was going to mention one thing. I'm going to mention it now. So recently when I was doing an interview for American in Paris, um, an interviewer uh, in a uh, regional newspaper said, so what was it like working with Mr. Gershwin? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, uh, well, he was, uh, you know, uh, it was well before my time. I know it might seem like it was around when, when, when he was, but we didn't, we didn't overlap, sadly. Um, but um, it's interesting as time advances how, uh, you know, perspectives change. Um, anyway, uh, I was fascinated with the, the songs and, the, and the, the music and the concert pieces. And at the same time, I was learning about arranging and orchestrating and getting an idea what that was all about. And when I was about 17, um, I put together my first Gershwin arrangement just for piano, um, where I was making choices as an arranger of, and, and I'll, uh, I'm gonna play it for you more or less as I remember what I did, it was a long time ago. Um, but uh, as I, I told many people, I hope you weren't expecting a concert performance because I'm not a concert pianist. But I, I can play a bit. I mean, I, I, writing is my forte. But um, I'm going to try to play um, someone to watch over me um, as I constructed it, uh, my version of it, uh, when I was about 17. So I'll, I'll start with that and get some of the piano playing out of the way. Okay. 66. Okay, so here's what was I. in the harmony um, and using some of the things that were 
more or less in the sheet music, but also creating little bits for myself. And years later, when I worked on my first um, uh, Broadway Gershwin musical, which was nice work if you can get it, in uh, 2012, I put little bits of that into my orchestration for someone to watch. It would be just for myself, uh, just to, uh, for, for the 17-year-old uh, and me to uh, be able to put that. Excuse me. I also did some better things, but, uh, and I'll be showing you a bit of that later. So that was my first attempt. And one of the things you might notice about my style there is it's pretty old-fashioned. Um, it's pretty much, it's something that I think George Gershwin himself would have understood. And I realized early on that I was attracted to the older original versions of things. In other words, uh, particularly in the 70s when I was a, a teenager and learning about this music, um, the Gershwin songs were still very much part of the um, the popular music, older music of, um, say, Frank Sinatra, Steve Lawrence, Edie Gourmet, people like that. But rather than doing it the straight way, so when this song was introduced by Gertrude Lawrence in 1924, she would have sung the refrain very strictly, you know, uh, there's a somebody I'm longing to see, I hope that she, that he, maybe she was 16. Uh, anyway, um, uh, it would be kind of straight, whereas in the 60s and 70s, uh, a singer, um, would sing, you know, like, there's a somebody I'm longing to see, which we call back phrasing, where they're kind of laying back behind the beat, singing around the beat. And that's fine, and, uh, the, you know, it's a very valid way of doing it, but I was just interested in kind of the original way that, that Gershwin himself had written his music and conceived it. And that would come back uh, when I had the opportunity in my Broadway work uh, to write things where there was a, an element of authenticity to it. So, um, what I wanted to show you here, now I need to get this thing on the air. Just take a second, everything's going to sleep around us. The proje oh, the projector's, the projector's going to sleep too, so I need to... So, um, I wanted to show you a bit of this, so nice work if you can get it. Yeah. Anybody happen to see it on Broadway? Yeah. How'd you like it? Good. It's fun, isn't it? Especially the orchestration. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, it was it was um, it was a new musical with Gershwin songs. With, with, uh, it was loosely based on um, uh, some of the early Gershwin musicals, but it was a new book by Joe Pietro, A lot of great gags, and directed by Kathleen Marshall. And um, what, let me see. Where do I have you? I wanted to show you, um, where is, let me see what this is, I've got this here. I was talking about my work, uh, all right, so here. So this is the sheet music, this is a, a, called a piano vocal, and it looks like the published music, and it's actually, it is similar to the published sheet music. And this is what happens on a Broadway musical before I do my work. Um, an arranger of some sort puts together the piano vocal version. Um, and this is what I worked from on, on this particular song, so I'm going to watch over me. And um, what I do is I take this piano music and then I uh, arrange it and, and orchestrate it you know, for the orchestra. And part of it, I do it all on the computer, by the way. I use a program called Sibelius. And um, part of it involves literally taking the notes that are there and assigning them to different instruments. But it also involves paraphrasing, uh, reimagining, re changing things around, as I did uh, originally. Um, and I'll, I'll be talking about that a bit. But uh, this is what I start with. And um, I was going to show you. So this is the Tony performance in 2012. Uh, from Nice Work, uh, which starts with a bit of Kelly O'Hara singing Someone to Watch Over Me. And there's a gag with a gun that you'll see because she's a, a gangster in the show, and so you'll see the, the thing where the, she has a gun and she sings a song. <clears throat> and then it goes into um, uh, a version of Sweet and Low Down, which was the opening number of the show. So one of the things we do for the Tony performances is we make adaptations from the Broadway numbers. So, so we shorten them and try to squeeze all the different cast members in and so on. So I thought I'd show you this first, or at least part of it. 
this. Now, please welcome two-time Tony winner, Matthew Broderick, and my beautiful friend and former co-star, Tony nominee, Kelly O'Hara, and the company of Nice Work If You Can Get It. Run our tail here. Take my gun, shoot to kill. There's a somebody I'm longing to see. I hope that he turns out to be someone to watch over me. What the low down there If you need a tonic And the need is chronic If you're in a crisis My advice is Grab a cab and go down Where the band is playing Where milk and honey flow down And everyone is saying And low down Philosopher and deacon You simply have to weaken Hear those shuffling people You can't keep your seat Professor Yeah Start your beat Is, um, it, might, it might be all right. Uh, actually, I would, in the interest of time, I was going to stop about there and move this picture on. Uh, but uh, you can see that that band for that number sounds kind of like the 1920s. You know, I was trying to write it in an authentic style. The show is taking place in 1928, and uh, that's with some liberties. I was trying to be uh, authentic with, with the way that I wrote the. It's kind of a Dixieland band there, so. Um, it happens, I, I don't have any surviving rehearsal footage, but I was going to say that my, my two tools that I work with, one are the, the piano vocals, as I showed you briefly. That's one essential tool for me. The other is rehearsal videos. Um, 
and I do have some of the next Gershwin show that I worked on, um, which is here. Um, let me close this. Um, so let's see, this I think is what I want. Um, so um, a year later, or two, maybe two years later, I worked on an encore's production of Lady Be Good, which was a recreation of the 1924 musical which starred Fred and Adele there. And anyone happen to catch this encore show, Lady Be Good? That's fine. It only ran for a week. Um, uh, but if, if, if you know the Encore series in New York, they, they revive old musicals of all different vintages. Some might be 60 years old, some might be 5 years old. But in the case of this show, Lady Be Good from 1924, very little of the original music had survived. And so my job was to recreate the orchestrations um, in the style as much as, as authentically possible. And as I said, there was an arranger before me. In this case, it was uh, Rob Fisher, wonderful arranger and conductor himself, um, who created the piano versions. And what I do have here, you might recognize this tall guy. This is Tommy Toon. Um, you might have seen him crazy for you uh, in other shows. So Tommy was one of the stars of this version. And this is a little bit of the rehearsal video that I would be looking at. Now, this is partly because I live in Boston and I'm working uh, in New York but also because I can't attend all the rehearsals, but I need to sit and, um, and watch this uh, over and over again and understand what's going on from one beat to the next as I'm working on my orchestrations. Um, so I just want to show you a little bit of Tommy here uh, in the rehearsal room. Time step there. So this is fascinating rhythm. And this typically for these numbers it starts with a vocal and then goes into the dance. So 
on. So we followed this record very closely. We used everything from it that we could, all the little bits and the voicings that George Gershwin himself played. We figured that's as well as you can get. Um, so um, I think I have here, there's a Broadway.com clips from the finished show of um, Lady Be Good. Um, so I'll, I assume my streaming is working. Uh, let's see if it is. Um, you can see a bit of, of Tommy's number and some other numbers uh, from the show, if, if the screening works. Let's see how, how it does. I think it's trying. Oh, how I long to be the man I used to be. Fascinating rhythm, oh, won't you stop picking on me? That was a really fun show, and um, you can hear that it sounds like what we think 1924. I mean, none of us were there to hear the music, but that's what we think it sounded like. And of the clips we just heard, almost all of it was my orchestrations. There were only a couple of little bits. There was the bit where we heard the song, we're here, we're here, we're here because I love you. We had the original orchestration for that, and the very ending that they played was the original orchestration from the overture, the end of the overture. But in the days before photocopying, a score was like gold. And what happened was that all these scores uh, of the popular songs were borrowed, lifted, used elsewhere, and so on. And it was just the songs that didn't have a life um, beyond that, that stayed in the archives. Uh, what did survive for the show, fortunately, were all the piano vocals. So we had the piano vocals. Uh, and we did some changing around. But basically, we worked from the piano vocals, and so I worked from those original records. And uh, there were a few orchestra records made in 1926 in England uh, from the British company. But I wanted to show as a quick example of, of how I used the original um, records uh, for the basis of my orchestration. Here's a, a lesser known Gershwin song, you may not know it, Hang On To Me. 
It's a very, it's actually a really nice song. So this also has a record of Fred Nadella's Fair coming by George Gershwin. And then I'll play you uh, some of my version of it. So here's the original. <laughs> I used that as though that was my piano vocal to, to work from. And here's my orchestration uh, of the song from our uh, 2016 Lady Be Good. Trouble may hound us, shadows around us, never mind my dear. Don't be downhearted when we get started, they will disappear. Listen to brother. So you can hear how it's, I think it's pretty convincing that it probably sounded pretty much like that in 1924 with the orchestra. We don't know for sure, but I, I, I like to think that it did. And all the little bits, all the arranging bits, um, the little, the chord voicings, the little lines between phrases and so on, I took right out of George Gershwin's piano and orchestrated it, giving those lines to the different instruments in our orchestra. And for encores, by the way, what's great about the encores series is we have large orchestras, we have 30 players. Um, and they're on stage uh, at City Center. Uh, they're on stage behind the cast. Uh, so they're very much a part of it. So we had a large, by Broadway standards, a, a large orchestra for that. So um, right after that, um, I got the call to work on American in Paris, which I was thrilled about because I had wanted to get on this. I knew about the show. Um, I knew the movie very well, a 1951 movie from MGM with Gene Kelly and Leslie Caron, I would imagine many of you are familiar with that movie. Um, and I thought it was a fantastic movie. And when I first heard about the project, um, I thought, well, they're going to make a um, musical, but I guess it'll probably be a lot like the movie. And I know the movie music, and I know the styles of the orchestrations and how it was done and so on. Wonderful MGM orchestrator, Conrad Salinger, who's a hero of mine, um, had, had, uh, had done the orchestrations in that. Um, and then my friend Rob Fisher, who was the music director of Lady Be Good, um, became the music director of, um, uh, of American Paris. But he told me uh, it was starting in Europe, it was uh, a primarily British creative team, British orchestrator, and the first version of American Paris ran in Paris at the Chatelet Theatre 
in uh, the fall of uh, 2015. So I wasn't a part of that. But then when it was transferring to Broadway, um, uh, they wanted to make some changes, including in the orchestration. So Rob, as the arranger, had very, very cleverly used both the Gershwin songs and the Gershwin concert music uh, as the basis for the songs in the show and the wonderful ballets. There are three big ballets. The opening ballet is based on the slow movement of the concerto in F. Um, the climactic ballet at the end of Act One is based on the second Rhapsody. Uh, I don't know if any of you know that. It's a wonderful piece. It's lesser known, but a fantastic piece of concert music by Gershwin. And then the final music, uh, the climactic music of Act Two is the American in Paris ballet that uses the music from the concert piece in American in Paris, but rearranged, reconstructed. It's not as long. It's, 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 it's different. It's very recognizable, but different. So the first orchestrator um, had done a nice job with the ballet parts. That was his field. He knew, understood that. He didn't know as much. He didn't understand the style of writing for Broadway, writing for singers, and so on. And um, and I was brought in uh, to first to, to redo a bunch of the songs, which I did, and I ended up doing a lot of other work on it. Um, but um, I do have some rehearsal video of, of this, so I want to show you what it was like in rehearsal first. Um, let's see, where is that? Uh, rehearsal. All right, here, I think. So this is uh, in a rehearsal hall. Um, this is uh, the th three leads. Uh, if you saw, you remember the three guys uh, in the show. This is... Um, Watch a little bit of their version of I Got Rhythm. Yeah. It is brilliant! We know you think he is your friend, but you go out together. <coughs> Since this time, come on. Don't we not help you talk to this? No, we cannot. Study this video. It goes on. It goes into a big dance number. Some of you might remember it. Um, and the time is flying by here. It's not supposed to be quarter to eight yet because I. Um, but so I'm adjusting what I'm doing. But um, so I had the piano vocal, and so that's a fake piano, as you might realize. So, so the, what the piano we're hearing is in the rehearsal room off camera, um, and and so I had the music that that rehearsal pianist is playing, and that became the basis of, of my orchestration. Um, which, if I have time, I'll, sh I'll show you that because I do have video of the show. But what I wanted to, to talk about, just to, briefly to talk about the process. So I make my orchestration. And then we have, as the orchestration is done, we, we have a couple of days of orchestra rehearsals with the orchestra in, in New York City. Um, and then we have the Zitzprobe, uh, which is a German word which means you sit and you explore. Um, and the Zitzprobe is when the cast first hears the orchestra. So the cast has been working with a piano player, and there's also a drummer there. Um, so they work with piano and drums for weeks, working out all the routines, learning the routines, and so on. And then there's the day, and it's the orchestrator's favorite day, uh, where you're the big hero, or you hope you're going to be the big hero. Uh, not always, but um, um, it's, it's a wonderfully exciting day when um, the, 
the cast comes into a rehearsal hall and sits and hears the music. And a friend of mine, David Chase, who's a wonderful music supervisor, said, it's the day the music goes from black and white to color for the cast. It's really true. Um, and what I do have is I have some video of the Zitz Probe from the tour version. Anybody see the show in Boston last year, by any chance? Yeah. So um, I also worked on the tour version, which was somewhat different. Um, and we did it. Our official opening was in Boston a year ago, but before that we were doing the tech at Proctor's Theater in um, Schenectady. And I have a little bit of the uh, of the from here. And now this smiling face here, this is Christopher Wielden, the director and choreographer, who's a brilliant, brilliant talent. Um, I, it was just a thrill to work with him. And we're all squeezed into this small room uh, above the theater. Uh, this is our Conductor David Allen Rogers, the orchestra's here. You'll see the cast in a minute. And it's funny, this particular little clip starts with an awful chord that makes everybody wince because some of the musicians were confused, some of them were in a different place. So the very first thing you hear is awful and then it quickly sorts itself out. But you'll see, you, you, I like to show this, you'll see some of the excitement and the thrill of, and, and this is a new cast and a new orchestra, and they're coming together for the first time. So, And this is wonderful. Where's the Try the space bar. Did it freeze? We're half frozen here. Hmm. <coughs> yeah, space bar is not working. It's not giving me a window to close it. Let me try this. There we go. Let's let me get out. Technology is great, except when it isn't. Um, I know. I, well, I want to show it to you. Um, I, I, if I have, if I have to close this thing, let me close the quick time. So um, right, let me just close that and then we'll reopen it um, and see if it works better the second time. There's right, this Tommy one. This is what we, oh, here we go. All right, thank you. Thanks for your patience. <laughs>
that was an exciting day, and there was a day like that a year before with the Broadway version, when it was all brand new. In this case, you know, this music had already existed, but this was the tour version, by the way, I reduced the number of players, part of what we did so that they could travel. On Broadway, we had 19 players, and um, for the tour, we had 13 players. And I took all of the music and made it work with 13, um, and I'm very proud of it, actually. In many ways, I think the 13-player version is better uh, than the Broadway version because I did all of it. I mean, it's the same as I But I, I, was able to fix, I was able to fix things that needed to be fixed that never got fixed. And uh, we have two really hard-working keyboard players there. Um, but uh, I'm very proud of it. And uh, there's also a London company, uh, which is running through January, which is using basically the same orchestration. But um, it's such a joy to spend time with these talented people. And as the orchestrator, I don't get much time with them. You know, they all spend weeks and weeks and weeks together, or months together for that matter, but especially in rehearsals, they're all together, the, the creative people. But I come in, I come to a couple of rehearsals, I come to the, uh, the CIS Probe and the orchestra rehearsals and the opening nights and other shows. But I don't get as much time with them as I would like, but I, I love being around them. Um, they're just so talented and so much fun. It's the best thing about working on Broadway is getting to, to work with all these talented people. So I wanted to show you that. And then, um, uh, let me see if I have this. I think I do. Um, this is some video of the, an early preview. Um, do I have time to play another clip? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then we can still stay and talk a little bit. We're good? We're good? Okay, good. I don't know. Good. Um, so, you might have come to our preview. Um, you might not know the real purpose of the preview. So a preview is before the official opening. Um, and the tickets are at a discount, which is to lure you in. But really the purpose of the preview is for the creative team to watch the audience watch the show and see how they're reacting and see how to make it better. And I love the preview process. With a new Broadway show, it's usually a month. And we're all watching the show and thinking about how do we make it better. And when it's a brand new show, we're making a lot of changes. Changes in the dialogue, changes in the orchestration, changes in the costumes, everyone's changing. And uh, you know, sometimes we're all so eager, we work at cross purposes, like there was a point in one of my shows, we had the meeting after one of the first previews, and the director said, I, I can't hear this something, I, I can't hear this, it needs to be fixed. So I thought, okay, I'll go fix it in the orchestration. The sound mixer said, okay, I'll fix it in the sound mix. Next night it was too loud, because we both fixed it. Um, and we didn't know the other one was going to fix it, too. Uh, but generally, um, you watch how the, how the audience is, is, work, is responding, and you figure out how to make it better. So this is an early preview of Broadway. Um, and actually, one of the things I'll just mention, this was really interesting. Before the first preview, if there's time, there is an invited dress rehearsal, which is where, uh, the, after they've gotten through the technical parts, uh, it's an invited audience of friends and family, uh, who are usually a very, very excited audience. Um, uh, it's, it's like, it's usually the, the best audience you'll ever play to. For mysterious reasons, the invited dress on Broadway of American in Paris was a disaster. Uh, if you, you know the movie The Bandwagon? You know, you know the scene where the bookers come walking out and all, all depressed because the show uh, early on, the show was like a I mean, It wasn't quite that bad, but it was a, everyone was sort of look, looking around, and, you know, and I couldn't even tell you what was wrong with it, but then magic happened in the next several nights. Each night, the show got better and better and better and better, and I couldn't even tell you what was different, but it was just the energy. Somehow, everybody figured out what they were doing. So this is the sixth preview, and I want to see if I can find the I Got Rhythm uh, number. Play some of that for you. Well, it must be before that. Okay, uh, that looks like part. Yeah, where I'm close. I'm in the middle of it. Okay. Let me see where I am here. Something, something, something.
Fisher's work, by the way, this part of this number. set in 1945 and so I orchestrated it in a style that would be believable as in 1945 but not like current, the latest thing on the hip rate of 1945 but something that had been around maybe since the 30s and so on. So, um, so that's, that's what I did in the whole show is I tried to make it believable that everything you were hearing could have been written more or less in, in 1945. and. Um, and uh, you know, it's a thrill to, to work on this and to be part of it. Um, uh, one more thing, I just want to ask you: Do any of you know who Barbara Hannigan is? Any of you familiar with Barbara Hannigan? 
Uh, if you don't know her, then I won't take the time to show you. But she is an amazing classical, contemporary classical soprano and conductor. She sings and conducts at the same time. And she hired me to write a Gershwin arrangement uh, of a medley of songs from Girl Crazy, which we did um, with several orchestras. And actually, you know what, I'll just play the ending clip, um, which is actually, is also I Got Rhythm. Um, but uh, let's see, where is it? Here it is. So this is from, uh, this is a pro promo video. This is Barbara in an interview, and then it goes to the end of this piece with a big orchestra. Um, uh, and uh, just to show you a little bit of what she does, if it works. So that, that's the ending of a 13-minute piece, and it's very unusual. You might check her out. It's not like I would write it for the Boston Pops. Um, uh, if anyone knows the Lulu Suite by Bear, anyone know modernist music? Uh, she did that in the program first, and then she wanted a version of Gershwin that would be uh, uh, fitting to follow the Bear and have the same kind of 30s modernist flavor. Uh, so a lot of it is really wacky um, and but delightful, and it was a huge hit. We did it at two festivals in Europe last summer. Uh, it's on a new album of hers called Crazy Girl Crazy, which has just been released, and it's, uh, she's a big deal in the classical world. Um, and uh, I, I love working with her. She's uh, she's pushed me to do outside of my comfort zone, and, and we've had a lot of fun. You know, one of the things that I do, just, just to mention that before I take some questions. Most of the writing that I do involves writing something you could put in front of players and it's easy to sight read, easy to rehearse, quickly comes together. You know, it needs to happen for Broadway, especially needs to happen with the Boston Pops. You know, perhaps I've written a lot for the Boston Pops. And when I bring in a new arrangement, the rehearsal time is so limited um, uh, that we read it down. And I, I know I've done my job right, we read it down, sounds fine. Keith says, any questions? No questions, next. If there are no questions, then I've done my job right. So the rehearsal time is very much at a premium. In this case, in, in her world, there's lots of rehearsal time. So she pushed me to write something that was really difficult. And the first time the players read it, it was a mess. But we had three days to rehearse it. We had three days, I mean, unheard of in the United States. We had three days to rehearse that along with some other things. And after three days, it was gorgeous. And it sounded wonderful. So it's, a, it's another way of writing. So I've been thrilled to, uh, to do that. So I think maybe what I'll do, um, if anyone remembers the movie with Jessica Rabbit, I told Barbara she looked like Jessica Rabbit. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, uh, I'll leave her there because it's in, in triumph at the end of that piece. And, and this, the orchestra is a Dutch orchestra, Orchestra Ludwig, uh, wonderful players. I, I, I loved hanging out with them and working with them. Um, uh, so uh, maybe I'll switch to taking some questions. Would that be appropriate at this time? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Anybody have a question? And should I pass the microphone around, do you think? No. If you repeat the question. I'll repeat the question. Okay, I'll repeat the question. Anybody have a question for me? No questions? Yeah, yes. You, you do? Yes, sir. How is it that the actors and the orchestra can remember all the changes that you go through? Because it's That's a great question. How is it that the actors and the orchestra, well, well the orchestra has the music in front of them. So it's easy. yeah yeah but the, yeah it's the actors so let me tell you about the actors I was talking about the preview process what the actors do in the preview process is unbelievable because the writers are changing it the script is changing every day and what they do 
is they'll rehearse the changes in the afternoon. But it takes a day to put in the changes because they have to work out the lighting and the sound and so on. So they'll rehearse the new way in the afternoon, perform it the old way that night, and then put in the changes the next day. I don't know how they do it. I mean, they very rarely, every once in a while, somebody will blow a line. But it's, I mean, but it's amazing to me how they do it. In, in the case of the orchestra, there's a whole process. Obviously, the orchestra has written music. But there's a whole uh, protocol and process with a copyist of putting in the changes in the music. Sometimes we'll cut out 16 bars. Sometimes the 16 bars we cut out have to go back in the next day, but in a different key, or things like that. And so the copyists are scurrying around, printing new bits of, of parts and putting the music in. And, and um, if there's time, we'll rehearse it for the orchestra. Sometimes the orchestra just gets a set of notes before the performance. This has changed, this is, you know, just be aware of it. This is different, this is different, this is different. But they're such good sight readers, they just, they read it. If it's written correctly, um, they'll, they'll play it correctly, for the most part. Good question. Yes? I have two questions. Sure, okay. How did you get your first break, and then can you actually enjoy going to a musical, or are you listening? Oh, I do enjoy it, I do enjoy it. Yeah. How, how did I get my first break, and, uh, and do I enjoy going to a musical? I love going to a musical, um, and uh, particularly because I get to see it a lot, and I can, I'm there before the audience is there. And my favorite place to sit, for the most part, is in the very front row of the mezzanine, at the Palace Theater, the front row of the mezzanine where you're up looking down. Uh, it was just my favorite place because the sound is coming right up. You can hear the orchestra coming up directly from the pit. Um, uh, so that's the easy, quick answer. Uh, I love going to the musicals. So I never get tired of it. Um, how I got my first break, I had a long and winding path in music. I've done a lot of different things in music. I was a rock and roll piano player. I evolved to become a, an arranger and producer of pop records in Los Angeles. And I got into film and TV music. Um, and uh, the particular way that I got into the Broadway work was um, in um, 2008, I arranged and produced a record for Michael Feinstein called The Sinatra Project where I wrote the arrangements in the styles of Nelson Riddle and Billy May. And anyone happen to know this record? Or you said you, you've seen the, the, the TV version. Who, who was it? Was it you, Lisa, who said you've seen the TV version? Or, uh, uh, of the Sinatra Legacy, where we played a lot of those same arrangements. And, and the idea of, it, of that project was to take songs that Frank Sinatra had done in one context and then arrange them in the styles of other records he'd made, but not copying records because he never actually made these songs in those styles. So as an example, I arranged exactly like you in the style of Billy May, who you may know from great 50s and 60s arranger. But Frank Sinatra had never actually made a record like that. He'd only sung the song on a radio show in 1948. So, uh, so, so there were a lot of arrangements in, in these styles. And in 2011, there was a production in La not La Jolla, in San Diego, the Old Globe Theater in San Diego was doing um, a, a new musical of Robin and the Seven Hoods, which was loosely based on the movie. You might have heard of the movie with Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra, the Rat Pack, and so on. And this, it was in the same way that Night's Work was a jukebox musical of the Gershwins. This was a musical uh, using all the catalog of um, Santa Khan and Jimmy Van Heusen. Um, and Sammy Kahn's widow, Tita Kahn, was one of the producers. And she had heard the work that I had done on, for Michael Feinstein uh, in that authentic style. And she said, I want that guy. I don't want just a typical Broadway orchestrator. I want that, that guy who did that because I want the music to sound like that. So I was hired um, to, to do that in, in, uh, in San Diego. And that's where I met a bunch of Broadway people, including David Chase, who was a dance arranger. I mentioned him, um, uh, and uh, uh, I, I, he in turn hired me for other shows. Um, he brought me in on Anything Goes. The next thing I did, actually the first thing I did on Broadway, was the 2011 version of Anything Goes with Sutton Foster. Anybody see that by any chance? It was a nice show. I did about half of that. They used some of the previous version from 1987, and David Chase and I did new dances, new overture, and so on. And uh, and that was terrific. But it, so that's another lecture of the Cole Porter stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah, that, that's what I was sort of going to ask you. I mean, you're clearly seeped wonderfully in Gershwin, but 
Is it very different for you to do something about Cole Porter or be very huh. someone like Johnny Mercer? Well, you're, you're talking about all my heroes. The question was, uh, obviously I'm steeped in Gershwin, but uh, what about the other great composers? So I've been very lucky that the first composers I worked with on Broadway were Cole Porter, George and Ira Gershwin, um, Rogers and Hammerstein, um, uh, who am I forgetting? Um, uh, what was the other one? Uh, I mean, uh, um, and Johnny Mercer, I've, I've, I've done work on Johnny Mercer's music. Um, and these are great. I, I love it. I, I, um, uh, I actually I did a show this season. It was the first time I'd done a show where the composers were alive. So, um, and it was uh, it was called Bandstand, music by uh, Richard Oberacker and Rob Taylor. Did anybody see it? Did see it? Did you like it? Yeah. Good. Uh, so they were alive. So they got the kibitz born. Um, uh, 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 and I enjoyed that very much. But it was you know it was a bit different. The thing in the case of. Uh, the ones who are gone, the Gershwins and Cole Porter and so on, they have trusts and they have executives who have very strong opinions, uh, at least as strong as the individuals themselves would have. So there are plenty of representatives. Rep uh, um, and uh, um, in, in case of the Gershwins, there are two descendants who control the catalog. Um, one of them, Mark Gershwin, actually looks like me. You know, people think we're brothers, but uh, we're not. But, uh, um, uh, they control the catalog and are involved in, in things like that. So, um, I mean, it's just a joy to work with all this music. I, I, you're right, I, I am steeped in it. And uh, uh, years ago, I decided I wanted to be the guy who was old enough to understand this music and young enough to do it with a computer. And, that, and that's worked out pretty well. I, I've been bridging that gap pretty well. Yes? Are you on the piano while you're... Arrangements, or are you doing it? You're hearing the instruments in your mind. Um, well, I'm hearing them um, these days. Um, I hear them in my mind, but I also hear them in, in the music program. I use Sibelius. It's kind of like an elaborate player piano. So I, as I put it in, it would take me a little time to open up these files. But every everything that you've heard from me exists in my laptop as a file of notation which I could also press a button and it would play, and it would sound like a sort of clunky um, mechanical version of what you heard, but that allows me to hear it, allows me to catch the wrong notes. Um, and so I knew that I have a keyboard beside my computer. I do most of my work um, up in my office. I have a nice piano downstairs without any other technology around, so I kind of like it that way. So as I go into the piano and I have a 1924 Victrola next to it, it's sort of my time machine, that, that room. But I was going to say, what working in Sibelius allows me to do is I email all these files everywhere. I email them to the copyists in New York and Los Angeles. Um, I actually spend very little time with the music on paper these days. I do have paper scores that the copyists hand me for the rehearsals, that I look at them that day and then put them in my shelf. Um, and I email the files. Uh, you know, we've, we've made a bunch of changes for the London version, and I emailed those, and, and they were copied there. So um, the computer has allowed so many things that, we, that, that were so difficult. I mean, this is one example. In, in all these shows, sometimes there's a replacement cast member who needs a song to be uh, in a different key, maybe a half step lower or higher. Um, in the old days, it would have just been written out by hand. with a lot of work. A lot more people employed, I suppose. But uh, these days, I mean, it's still some work, but I can change the key in the computer. If it's a small change, it's relatively easy to do, and then it gets printed out again, but it's, it's not a complicated thing to have multiple different versions of the music. Yeah. Yes? You talked about, as a teenager, you were interested in music. Yeah. When you graduated well in high school, what was your trajectory in terms of where you went, how uh, much you thought you would, might do? Um, Can when, I add on to that question? Because yes. uh, as someone as talented as you, did you learn your talent, or were you born this way? <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, um, so um, I'm going to see if I can find something. I, I had debated. I had debated about doing this. Phil, yes. Can you just repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. The question. I'm sorry. The, the question was uh, when I was graduated from Wayland High School. What was my trajectory? Um, so I was looking. I want to see if I can find a picture of me not long after I graduated. To, to, which will amuse you, you, I guarantee a laugh if I can find it. Um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, <laughs> so, does that partly answer your question? 
I haven't, I haven't changed a bit, right? <laughs> so, um, I, I, I want to say, when, when I was 14, um, I was taking, uh, uh, my parents would drop me off at Riverside on Saturday mornings, and I would go in uh, to see the sat Saturday matinees at the Colonial and the Schubert of the Boston Triads. And I was really interested in theater at, at the age of 14, or 15, so and I saw, um, Maine and Bajor and Ben Franklin in Paris, a bunch of things on their way to New York. And I was really interested in, in theater. But when I was 16, the lure of rock and roll got me. Um, and I started growing that hair. And I, I still could. Um, and, um, and by the time, and, and I was so full of myself that I, when I graduated from high school, I thought I knew everything I needed to know about everything. And I was already working as a keyboard player, and I was just ready to go out and and in those days, I graduated Wayland High School class of 69. And um, I, uh, it's a long story that I'm simplifying, but I didn't go to college. I'm actually a college professor who never went to college. Um, I, I went out, I was working as a keyboard player. Um, I was invited to Los Angeles to play on a record. Um, I played here with several uh, singer-songwriters, Livingston Taylor, uh, Jonathan Edwards, Tom Rush, um, and so on. So I was in that folk-pop world. and and. At the same time, I had this interest in the older music, but I thought of it as just a hobby. I didn't think at the time. I, I just thought it was my interest. And, uh, you know, I was involved in the pop music of, of the day. And the, the peak of, of, um, of, of that work was, uh, I was in Bonnie Raitt's band in 1977, 78, I'll see if I can find that. So here, you can guess which one is me. Uh, see if you can figure out which one is me. Um, uh, the short one, right? Um, uh, and so, uh, anyway, you know Bonnie Raitt? You know Bonnie Raitt? Yeah. yeah. And one of the thrills while I was playing with her, her father, John Raitt, came to visit and, um, and asked if we, you know, wanted to do something. Um, and asked if he could sing Oklahoma. And I actually knew enough of Oklahoma. Nobody else in the band had ever played Oklahoma, I guarantee. But I knew enough of Oklahoma to get through it. And he was then almost as old as I am now, I was amazed he could still stand up and sing. Uh, uh, and he, but he, he sang beautifully. It was, it was a thrill, because I, I knew who he was. And I, um, and, but I also I loved working with Bonnie. So that was kind of the peak of my career in the 70s. And then what happened was, in the early 80s, pop music changed to punk and new wave. And there wasn't really anything I wanted to do as a keyboard player in that. And then at that point, I had gotten involved um, I had met film composers, TV composers, arrangers, and orchestrators. Uh, prior to that time, I never had an interest in that kind of music. But I decided I would reinvent myself as a film and TV composer. And it took me a number of years, but I did eventually do it. And by the 90s, I was a busy composer, arranger, orchestrator, working in TV and film in LA. And, uh, and I became primarily a writer. Uh, and my, my playing kind of faded away a little bit. I'm trying to get it back. Another question? Yes. Two questions, but uh, one of them is, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, when you talked about European orchestras and have, in, in this one case where, with Barbara Hannigan, you were able to uh, have three days of rehearsal, which was... Right. Uh, A luxury. Uh, un, yeah, three days of rehearsal, un, unknown luxury here. Yeah. And, uh, and what are the other differences that you found between, say, uh, L.A. or... You know, working in Europe or working in Boston. Okay. In, in, in yeah, sure. So the question is, what are the differences working in uh, Europe or New York or LA? Uh, one of the things I'll say, my favorite thing about being a musician is getting to hang out with musicians. Um, musicians are, the world over, are generous, funny, warm, supportive. Um, uh, they're, they're great people, and I, and I love them. I have dear friends in all the cities I've worked in. Um, I would say that um, my favorite players are the London players. The London players just have something extra. Um, and I was thrilled with the, the version of American Paris in London. Um, does anybody know the name John Wilson in his orchestra? Has anyone heard of John Wilson? Um, he does something like what I do, but with his own orchestra. He recreates music from MGM, and, and he does a wonderful thing with a big orchestra, and he does it at the proms at the Albert Hall, and uh, he's a, a friend, I'm happy to say, but he, he uses wonderful players, and 
they understand, in many ways, the Brits understand and appreciate American music more than we do. I don't know if any of you have noticed that, but it's true. They, they've always loved the same kind of music uh, that we do here and the same kind of music I do. They've always loved it. It never went out of fashion. Uh, and the players really understand it. And the brass players have this big sound, I think, and I was hearing it's because they have a tradition of the brass bands in, in England, and they develop these big, beefy sounds. And just, it's, it's, it's just extraordinary. So I love, I love the, the British players especially. I love working with the Dutch players, and some of them were German. I mean, they're all delightful. I have dear friends in Los Angeles. Um, uh, the, the similarities are much greater than the differences. There's certain, you know, there's regional accents of certain, in certain ways. Uh, but overall, uh, you know, if I have good players, um, good players are, are good players the world over, and, and much more similar. Yeah, the second question. Yeah, the second question, a totally different thing, but you mentioned about uh, how exciting it was when when people would watch previews, and the previews for were for you and others to watch the faces and, yeah. and the reactions. Right. What can you give a couple of examples of what you're looking for and the kind of thing you would change if you watched? the people watching the preview? Yeah, the question was, um, in the preview process, when I said that it's the creative team watching the audience watch the show and seeing their reactions and deciding what works and what doesn't work, um, was the question what change, how we decide what changes to make? Yeah, um, and, and, and what sort of things do you look for? What kind what, of things? Well, certainly, um, in all the musicals, there are there are gags, there are jokes and laughs, and they, you know, they talk about does the joke land, meaning does it get a reaction from the audience. Um, so a writer will listen to a line, and here's what happens sometimes. Um, say a line in an early preview doesn't get a laugh, that the writer thought, he thought it was funny, he thought it was funny, and it doesn't get the laugh. Uh, a couple of things could happen. Um, and the, 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 you know, there's a discussion afterwards uh, with the director and everyone, we're all talking, we have a huddle, uh, after the show is over. Uh, they'll talk about what worked, what didn't work. And they also are doing this, you know, when I'm not around. Um, the, um, the, the writer might say, let's give it more time, I, I think it's going to work. The actor might say, I think I know how I can deliver it tomorrow night, so it's going to work better. Um, uh, the director might say, why don't you do this, or do add this little bit of business, or whatever it is. Um, and that's, so that's just the writing part of it. Um, there's also a lot of technical things um, in terms of the previews. The technical aspect of the costumes, for example. Um, you see all these costume changes. And uh, they're done with snaps and Velcro and magical stuff. Um, uh, you know, I worked on um, the Cinderella um, uh, from a few years ago. I was not the main orchestrator, but I did some work on that. And the whole business of uh, Ella, who's Laura Osnes, twirling around and having the dress reveal and so on, the, the beautiful gown. That was a big process. But even other costume changes, they have to work it out. And then the other thing is, I've never actually seen this, but I know what goes on. Behind the stage, backstage, during the show, it's a madhouse. <laughs> People running around. The actors are running from one side to the other to get in place. They're trying to change clothes, trying to get in their costume. Um, they might have, you know, they all wear wireless microphones. They have a pack in their um, and they're, you know, attached to their hip or something, and, the, and they have the, the microphone is taped, you see the mics sometimes, you know, taped to their forehead, and maybe there's a problem with that. So they're, they're running around like crazy, they're trying to figure out, do I have enough time? And I remember very well uh, in uh, one of the shows, uh, in, in one of the dress rehearsals, um, one of the actresses came running out in exactly the wrong costume. It was like a dance number, and she was, she was in, you know, it was like, a, um, maybe it was, it was a number like the one we saw from Nice Work, you can get it with the, with the, um, the dance hall girls, and then she was in a, uh, a long frock or something, you know, it was just the exact wrong costume that she's doing all the moves and the dances. And, and that's why, I mean, th things go wrong. So there's a lot of technical stuff that, that is solved in the previews um, as well, but, for, and, and in terms of the music changes, uh, one thing I was going to talk about, take a minute to talk about. So, I described the piano vocal version that I get, made by the arranger. Um, it might be Rob Fisher, David Chase, other people I work with. And 
it's a piano version. It's meant to be played on the piano. It's used to rehearse with and so on. So on the piano, you can do da 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 substitute musicians coming in. So part of what I do is take the musical gestures in the piano vocal and find a way to paraphrase them and create them as a conversation. So instead of just one line, it becomes maybe a conversation between the brass and the saxes so that they each get to breathe. That's something I'm always taught, telling my students at Berkeley, let the players breathe. Um, they have to breathe. Um, so, so as I say, I kind of paraphrase it to, to make it playable. Um, but then um, some of the musical changes might be because a dance number is too long. Um, you know, some of these dance numbers are just are too long, or they have to be cut, or, or maybe sometimes they add some bars. Uh, we make a lot of changes in the dances in uh, American in Paris, um, and it involves a lot of of tailoring. You know, I, I think of what I do often. It's sort of like being a tailor or a cabinet maker. You know, you measure it. You know, how long do you want this? So, be this size and, and, and so on. It's, it's a craft and an art, but a lot of it is about crafting to fit very specific. And, and I'm, actually, I enjoy having all these specifics as an orchestrator that I have to fit. It's, it's relatively easy. It's hard for me to wake up in the morning, sit down at the piano, and think, okay, I'm going to write some music today. What, what kind of music? What about? I mean, I, I can, I've done it, but I don't have a purpose if I, you know, compared to having an assignment. I, mean, I like assignments with a deadline and a check. Those are great motivators. Uh, not, my, not the only motivators by any means, but uh, you know, I'm very grateful that I've had this opportunity later in life to do this kind of work and um, uh, um, to be involved with all this great music. And, and that I'm also grateful that I evolved out of my 70s music and found new things to do in music and uh, that I'm not stuck in the 70s playing the same songs that I was playing. Um, are you ready to give me the hook? Well, if there's uh, one last question. question. I want to follow up on this gentleman's question. Okay. I asked you whether your talent was innate. Or oh, was I'm sorry. Innate? Whether my talent was innate. Well, I would say I did have some innate talent. I played piano um, by year at an early age. And, um, and I would noodle at the piano before I had lessons. And I, I, yes, I did. Um, one of the things, that, one of the talents that I had, you know, um, a lot of what I've done this uh, involves listening to old records and analyzing them and understanding what makes them work, and that's a combination of experience and a natural ability. So when I started out doing this, I could hear the lead lines, I could hear the top notes in the melody, I could hear the bass notes, I could tell what the chords were. But the middle was sort of a vast model. I didn't know what was going on. I, I was just guessing. You know, what, what, what were the second violins and the, and the trombones and the bassoons and the second trumpet and the second clarinet? What were they doing? I didn't know. Uh, and, and through years of experience, uh, I do know. And now I, you know, I can listen to a record and understand. Um, you know, in the same way, I mean, to me, it's sort of like looking at a painting and saying, well, there's the green and there's the blue and there's the red. That's how I hear a record or a recording is, you know, there's the, the blue that's a clarinet and the red that's a trumpet or whatever it is. So I have that, that's, it's a combination of maybe a talent and, and a, a skill. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you well, thank you all. That was fascinating. And I hope that my two daughters used to do, there's a lottery thing you can do in New York for our Broadway plays. And both my daughters went separately um, to America and Paris. Oh, great. And they thought it was one of the best shows of the season. Uh -huh. The bad part was, since they both went, they were like, no, they want to go to something else when I come into it. <laughs> <laughs> but I love watching. Say one thing? Yeah. So I'll just mention, so there is a North American tour of America and Paris. And in case you'd like to catch it, it's going to be in Providence in March. Uh, and I'm going to go down and see them. I haven't seen them in a year. They've been all over the country. Uh, but they will be in Providence in March. And, uh, wait, 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 we have an idea then. Maybe, Ashley, we could do a field trip and we could go with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Okay.
Okay, Ashley. Okay. <laughs>